Welcome back, everybody. We are now going to go into a Q&A panel with some of our judges who are joining us today. So I'll introduce them uh, one by one, and then I'll sort of pose a question to each. And then while we're doing that, uh, teams, as you are, you are uh, in the loop, you can post your questions uh, in the chat or raise your hand, um, and then we'll, we'll prompt for questions. And you can uh, turn on your mics or just post them in the chat, uh, and uh, we will ask them to our panelists here. Our first panelist is Matthew Calabrese. He's a mechanical design engineer from Skyline Attractions, working on roller coaster development and engineering. Our next panelist is Gabriel Russ. He's an electrical engineer from Irvine, Irvine Andre Engineering, and he's a roller coaster control systems design and installation. Uh, we have Amado Seda Castillo is a technical design lead from Cockrum Scenario, uh, and he, they work on themed engineering solutions. We have Harrison Katz, who's an engineer at ATA Engineering, where they work on engineering analysis and finite element analysis. And we have Michael Troyes, a mechanical engineer from Tate, who, uh, who works on live show technology um, and Hopefully, uh, we'll have coming in pretty soon, uh, we also have uh, Matt Schmotzer, who's a professional ride model engineer from Print My Ride Detroit. Um, so thank you uh, to all of our panelists for being here. So I just want to uh, run through um, each of you. So we'll start with uh, Matthew. Um, and tell us about uh, your student experience. What were you doing as a student? What activities did you do um, that, that led towards where your career's gotten to now? some audio issues. I can't hear anyone on the stream right now um, in the call. <laughs> I, I can see some people as we go through. <laughs> Thank you, Gabe, for the support. I should have audio now. Um, let's see. Oh. Everything is louder. Um, Mike Troyes, I see you on my screen. Uh, you just say hello, see if I can hear you. Hey, can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. There we go. Um, so I. Let's start with you then. So, so tell us about, uh, you know, what activities were you involved uh, when you were a student um, that that led towards uh, your position now? Uh, so, for me, the, the big one really was the the RIT Theme Park Enthusiast Club, who was competing here today. Uh, I was one of the four founding members of that club back in 2014-2015 time frame. Uh, so, for us, it was really kind of putting that club on the map, you know, we went from being non-existent to uh, being invited to some of these design competitions that have become more and more established over the years and competing against some of the very well-respected clubs from all over the country. 
uh, and even countries, I guess, including some of the, the Canadian schools that participate as well. Um, so for me, just being a part of the theme park club really uh, kind of led to all the opportunities that I've had. Uh, my senior design project as well was, was sponsored by a themed uh, entertainment company and involved uh, designing hydraulics for restraint systems. So those are the two main things that kind of led me to where I am today uh, from my college experience. All right. Um, Gabriel Russ, same question. What, what were you doing during college and, and how did that lead to where you are now? So unfortunately, I went to a small school in the middle of nowhere. So I didn't have the chance to do many of the theme park engineering group things. Mainly, I went to IAPA. Um, I had my own side project, which was uh, designing a linear synchronous motor for a Connects coaster. That's still somewhat in progress, but um, that sort of led me down the path into controls engineering. I found the company that I'm working with through that project and uh, graduated and started working with them. All right, good to hear. You don't have to be part of a big school with a big program to, to find uh, a way forward. Um, Harrison Katz, uh, you're... Um, yeah, I'd say uh, things like this, you know, being part of competitions like this and being part of the different organizations that exist within the theme entertainment industry. So, um, you know, if you're an engineer, ASTM is a big... Uh, opportunity network if you're part of the artistic side of things, the TEA and engineering, it doesn't, not just art, um, as well as IAPA. So um, networking is a huge thing that you can do. Um, and, you know, obviously this year is a little bit different, um, but being part of the Zoom and being part of these different, um, different events is definitely helpful. All right. Uh, Amato. Yeah, so I went to UT Austin. I was also um, very heavily involved in their theme park engineering group. I joined in the second semester of it being founded and was very much heavily invested. I would skip class to travel to events like Skyline Attractions, Skynex, or IAPA, ASCM. And those are all insanely good memories from college times, um, as well as other things just tangentially related. Like at one point I was doing simulations of Harry Potter episodes where we could play out the different curses that got cast at the different stages of the story. Um, I joined a juggling society at one point and just really doing things to figure out what I like and well, it happened to be theme parks, immersive experiences, those kinds of things. All right, and uh, Matt Calabrese, I uh, see you in here. Yeah, sorry, I didn't realize I got placed back into my old breakout room. Um, for me, I uh, was introduced to the industry kind of through a friend of mine who started um, the theme our theme park group at Ryerson. And throughout, through that, I ended up going to ASTM and that's where I kind of got bit by the bug. And from there, I went to every ASTM meeting that I that I could. I went to every IAPA event. Um, we started our own competition that year, the uh, Ryerson Thrill Competition. And um, I got a job at uh, Canada's Wonderland as a rides maintenance technician. So I got into all the nitty gritty of the rides and how they worked and, you know, what different companies did different and how that affected the uh, final product. And uh, actually turning those wrenches and doing that work really gave me a leg up in terms of being able to set myself apart entering the industry. All right. Uh, we will open it up to to students to ask questions from our, our panel of experts here. Um, Justin, I see your hand going up. Hello. So my question, so uh, there have been like 
a lot of rides um, shown here. And I mean, since this is like one of the first few, um, just as like the, this is like the first time that this is like happening, um, I just have curiosity, like what did you expect like uh, coming into here? And how did, I guess after today, like did this like uh, change your expectation? Yeah, among our panelists are, are um, people who have been uh, judging all kinds of different um, different leagues and different portions of the work being done here. So we've got all kinds of different experiences. So um, for for those who are doing uh, safety and functionality this morning, so um, that's uh, Matthew. Um, tell us about how that how that went. How did uh, you know? What were your ex expectations going into this competition? You know, a week ago and going into today, and and how did that compare to what you saw? Yeah. Um, during our orientation, what we were told to expect was, or how to look at it was, a perfect score would be something that we would put out as a professional, or we would expect members of our team to put out. Um, in terms of an actual product and actual work that we would show to a, uh, authority having jurisdiction or whatnot. So that's really the lens that I think a lot of us uh, look through. And then bonus points were, would be something that absolutely blow you, blew you away. So I think there were aspects of most of the submissions that really did meet that level in, in some regards. And I think going forward as the years progress we'll see more and more um, developed projects being put forward in this competition as uh, people realize how just how big the uh, the stakes are and how strong the competition is and that's really what you're shooting for something that is that is complete at a professional level and it's really really hard to do and I don't think we really expected anyone to get to that level. Um, but we were, I think, really impressed that a lot of teams were able to get that to that level in different aspects of what they put forward. Yeah, we certainly set a, an impossibly high bar um, on purpose to, you know, push all the teams to go as far as they can. Um, we have uh, uh, Gabriel and Amato. Um, yeah, what, what were... Uh, things that really impressed you about uh, the, the teams or surprised you? Um, the sheer amount of work period that goes into the design and fabrication for some of you in all of these rides is exceptional and way more than I think a lot of us did as students and would have loved the opportunity to have. So props to all of you on that. Um, we were in the safety and reliability group. So we got to experience the rides as they were experiencing things that were sometimes unexpected or that the ride was not operating as planned. There was some impedance or maybe it was routine maintenance and it was detected. Um, so we got to see the backside of it and got populated with reports saying like, oh, hey, this passenger broke, let's figure out what happened. And so it was really cool to see from that side what you guys thought that you had implemented into your design and ended up becoming more of a pain or perhaps it wasn't failing where you predicted, but it was all in all very good to see the way you guys were thinking and reacting to those changes. Yeah, pretty much the same thing as Amada said. Uh, I was also on reliability and I was also on the uh, control systems review and risk assessment review. Um, I did initially coming into this not expect a lot from the control system side because uh, typically this kind of group attracts more mechanical engineers than electrical engineers. And while you could tell that most teams were primarily had their control system designed by mechanical engineers. The amount of detail and the thought that was put into it was still very impressive for someone who lives and breathes control systems. 
And the risk assessments were, I think, very impressive. Some of those were on par or at the same level that we turn into actual governing bodies. So that was uh, very impressive for me. Awesome. Uh, another question from our students. We've got a bunch of groups here. We've got, I think, a lot of our teams. Some groups are set up individually. Some groups are, are the entire team in one room, which is really exciting. Um, yeah, turn on your mics and uh, ask away. Hi, we have a question for the panelists. Um, it's more about just like your experience. We're just wondering like what your favorite projects that you've worked on before is. So yeah, it, each of our panelists, um, you know, of all the projects that you've worked on, what is your favorite? That is honestly probably a tough question. I'd say every, every project we've worked on has had some element that we've really, really loved. Um, it's hard to pick a favorite just because, you know, each one has, there's a part that you really, really love and they all sort of blend together. Um, I'd say my favorite one that I've done that is open right now is uh, Steel Vengeance just because that's a crazy attraction all around. But I, I can't really look back and think of an attraction that I didn't love working on. I'd have to say for me, uh, designing the uh, new infinity flyers for GCI. Uh, that's kind of my baby and I, I, I love those. And, and getting to test the uh, prototype on white lightning um, was really awesome. And um, I'm really excited about that product and I can't wait to ride a full one. I think for me, my Kind of, kind of two answers. One from a student perspective, working on projects. Um, my, my two experiences at the Ryerson competition that uh, Matt mentioned earlier, uh, having participated in that twice for me was our experiences. I will never forget the number of people I met, both as students and you know industry professionals or people that I still consider friends and and great colleagues and that I hope to interact with for years to come. And then um, as a young professional. Um, my, my first project that I was kind of thrown into the flames with uh, was the, the Born Stuntacular at, at Universal Orlando and, and being able to be a part of such a big show as my first full-time project, if you will, uh, was something I think I won't ever forget. Um, yeah, I, the company I work for uh, is unfortunately under some pretty strict NDAs, so I can't talk about projects specifically. Um, but as has been mentioned, a lot of them all have their little fun things about them. So everyone's unique, everyone's individual, and they all have ways to be fun and uh, frustrating at the same time. Uh, so everyone is, uh, is a joy. <laughs> I'll echo that sentiment. Um, some of the stuff that we play with, and in my case, it's at a scenery shop. So these are physical things that are in the background. And if I do my job correctly, you won't think about the fact that there's bones behind all of it. Um, but it varies so much. Like there's artificial rock work, there's practical custom architecture, themed interiors. Um, we've also done museum jobs and I think that's my favorite that I can talk about. Um, we did a museum dedicated to United States Marshals in Fort Smith, Arkansas. And one of the features of it is a wall that is like 60 feet by 10 foot high, filled entirely with plaques of the names of every single one of the United States Marshals. And each one of those plaques has individual lighting, is adjustable and is just a very stunning piece to look at in a museum with an empty room and nothing to stare at, but that opening in the wall with 600 plaques. So that was something fun.
I'd like to ask another question. Um, just with like a lot of the innovations we're seeing, like more rides incorporating kind of more immersive like robotics, maybe VR. What changes uh, have you been like seeing in your own experience and where do you like see yourself going in the future um, in terms of like more innovation? So yeah, looking forward, what's, what's coming? What's next? in the industry. Um, so, so Matt, you talked about infinity flyers. Um, you know, what's next for that? And, and what, uh, what do you think is, is the next step? So in terms of, of with GCI and that project, the next step is the new Titan track, which is the steel wooden roller coaster track. And, uh, what's cool about that is, uh, we got rid of all the welds in the track and that's something that's been happening over the past few years across the industry uh chassis for trains and everything will be big machine pieces rather than welded components all together and we took that approach and brought it to the track so now there's no welds which are the single highest point of maintenance for track because as soon as you put a weld in there you've put a future crack into that material over time because of how it heat treats uh, the materials. So by eliminating that, I think we've created a really uh, interesting product that will uh, last a lot longer. And then, you know, we're, as Skyline, we're also playing around with a, a bunch of new projects um, and concepts that take into consideration some of the things that uh, RIT mentioned there. So I think a continuation of integrating new technologies um, in terms of aug augmented reality and uh, uh, simulations and all that kind of stuff into ride systems is going to be a trend that continues. All right. Go for it. Um, I'd, I'd also mention, similar to what Matt was saying, um, the company I work for does a lot of mechanical and structural design and analysis, so we're seeing um, more dynamic systems that are higher in efficiency, so they're not as heavy, um, and we're seeing uh, more reliable systems. So as Matt mentioned, less welds, more um, connections that don't fatigue as easily. So um, I think in the future, I guess the hope is that we'll see structures that require less um, preventive maintenance and more uh, reliability overall. So I think that, sh that will be happening. Very exciting. Uh, Amato, I'm interested to hear, what do you think is next in the, the museum and, you know, live exposition uh, sort of side of the attractions industry? Immersive. So we're seeing big jumps at this with pioneers like Meow Wolf releasing their new Omega Mart in the Las Vegas area and stuff like that. I think the next move is to bring that to museums. We want the artifacts displayed to be an intimate experience with the person in front of them. And the way to individualize that is through heavy integration. And as we're seeing the new innovative technologies come through, they're making it more and more possible. We're seeing, because we're also a fabricator, we're seeing more and more components added to our show pieces that we produce. And so we'll see like, oh, okay, this display case actually has a sensor to control the humidity of the artifact, as well as a hidden code that you can scan with your phone. Um, terrible example of interactivity, but it is a step. And it's a step that might not have been there five years ago. So integrating more and more what we can create with individual interactions on display. Really exciting. Uh, Mike, I'd love to hear what, uh, you know, how is innovation happening and, and what's next for the live show and live entertainment side of the industry? 
Um, so the, the very first thing that actually came to mind for me that was interesting was uh, in the question VR was kind of brought up. And one of the things that I thought was fascinating uh, that I got to experience at, you know, at our facility was uh, we interact a lot with show set designers and, and people on the artistic side of things and them conveying what they want to see. Uh, and what we've been doing with them now is take this for a live production. Uh, we can give them headsets and let them walk around and view their the production they want to put on before they ever, you know, before we ever put the get the machines running and get parts built. They can see exactly what experience they're going to end up with. That to me is something that's interesting that you would have never seen, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and I would love to see more of that uh, to piggyback on Amato what Amato said as well, like we, we deal so much in interactivity and immersiveness. Uh, it's all about not viewing something, but being a part of something instead. And I think that that sentiment is going to continue in all forms of live entertainment as we move forward here. Yeah. And from our side, we're starting to see a lot more in terms of interactivity, even on roller coasters, because there's only so high you can put track. You can only, take a car so fast before you start introducing all sorts of other challenges, but adding show scenes to roller coasters, it's, I've gotten to work on some prototypes that involve that very fun, very exciting to ride. And I can also see additional safety measures being implemented. Um, we work a lot with retrofitting older rides and while they're perfectly safe, we can upgrade their safety, make them even more reliable, more safe. And if that's what we're doing now, I can't wait to see what extra levels we're going to be able to, achieve in terms of reliability and safety in rides. All right, lots to look forward to. More questions from our students. Um, I had a question um, for Matt, actually. Um, this summer, I'm going up to uh, Cedar Point and doing uh, a ride maintenance um, internship similar to a Candace Wonderland. And I'm just wondering, how did that help you um, going into the industry? And what do you wish you would have done um, while you were there? Um. All right. Yeah. So Matt and, and anyone else who wants to chime in, um, you know, what, what are the experiences of the jobs that, that uh, you had that played a big role or, or that you wish you had done um, before going full-time? First of all, congrats. It's going to be a great experience for you. Um, if it's anything like what I, how, or how the shop was divided at Wonderland, you'll have your uh, group that you'll work within and you'll have a rotation of maybe five or six rides that you'll work on uh, and you'll work on one every day and rotate through them through the week. So that way you're, you're, you get familiar with your ride systems, but you don't get fatigued by just looking at the same one over and over again and let it become or become complacent and it becomes easy to miss stuff. But then what I would suggest is if on your days off, try to pick up shifts from other uh, people that are off, out sick, that don't show up and get into as many different uh, groups as possible take as and see as many different ride systems as possible because you can know how to calculate a wheel but you have to, and all, a bearing calculation and everything but learning about the finer points of how to design the shaft to to work through there and and what infrastructure you need to make all of these things work mechanically is not something that you get uh an, educa an education on in school, and you'll be able to pick that up a lot quicker by seeing them in real life and working on them. And uh, that'll give you a, a, a head start when you get into the industry, um, knowing what you need to design rather than having to try to figure it out. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Looking forward to it. I'll, I'll add to that as well. So I got to spend the summer uh, at Carowinds uh, in their maintenance division. Uh, similar kind of setup, you know, same uh, chain, so similar setup to what Matt mentioned where you, you have your own individual group. Uh, for me, the big thing is uh, once you do your maintenance for the day, you're gonna have some what I'll call downtime or time to kill. You're gonna have uh, either ride breakdowns or, or other things that need to get done throughout the day, but you may have some time where you're just hanging out and I would 
highly encourage you to use that time to talk with the guys who might have been there 10, 20 years at the park. And, you know, they might have something that aggravates them every single day of the week, something that some engineer designed. And, you know, there are instances where, where that component or what have you, uh, that there likely was a reason for it. But at least understanding their perspective of, man, I wish they had only done this, made this little change. It would make my life easier. It would save me 10 minutes every day. It's really getting in their heads as, as people who do that for a career and understanding uh, the frustrations they have will go a long way in making you a better designer. And, and honestly, that advice goes for any you know career uh, in this field. Uh, I take it with me now. I'm not an end user of the product that I am. We have road crews out on, you know, on tours all over the world. And as much time as I can take interacting with them and understanding how I can be better to, to better help them on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, again, I think it's just extremely important. Yeah, I'd like to just come off of that for just a minute here. I think, you know, this was said during the, uh, the other Q&A session, volunteer a lot. I think that's kind of what uh, Matt and Mike are getting at is to talk to people, volunteer, do extra stuff. Um, and this goes outside the industry too, in any job function, especially if you're an intern, talk to as many people who work there as you can, volunteer for extra work, try and get involved in different things because this is a good opportunity to see what it's like to actually work there and also to see what it's like to actually do that type of work. So I think any opportunity you can take to learn more, I think is hugely beneficial. There will also be manuals just lying around the place. Read them. Yeah, thank you guys for all your advice. Yeah, well, looking forward to it. Uh, Gabe, you can uh, chime in. I see you. Uh, <laughs> I was just excited. gonna mention, um, yeah. my big thing is always remember where your PPE, I know You'll hear it a lot. It's there for you. This is a dangerous machine. Please be safe. Take care of yourself. All that good stuff. All right, we will go two more questions. All right, Ryan. All right, I have one specifically for Gabriel. So you said you worked on the uh, LSM for a scale model. For doing that, did you have to use a uh, like an Intel processor, or how did you get that to work properly? So for that's a wildly technical question, which is good for you. <laughs> so for that, um, and actually I've restarted that project recently. What I use is uh, a three-phase motor drive because that's really what it is. It's and a linear synchronous motor is an unrolled three-phase AC synchronous motor. So with some special sauce that you add in, you can really just use a standard three-phase motor drive for those. Yeah. Or you can uh, also try, I have went through a lot of different revisions. I also used uh, H-bridges just to individually fire coils, which is good, but that also adds a whole bunch of other controls complexity. Um, if you are interested in stuff like that, I'd say definitely uh, get a hold of me sometime. For sure. And are there any cost-saving measures that you can recommend that aren't going to completely ruin everything? Uh, that, that is the hard thing, especially if you're a college student on a budget. This is It's not a cheap project. Um, keeping it small. The, the smaller, the better. Um, try and use as much existing stuff as you can. Um, don't, don't try and build stuff just for this. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll pitch to the judges um, of, of 
all of the uh, the rides that that you've seen and that you've judged throughout this. Um, which which one uh, seems like the most fun as far as a, a ride concept? Not something that that is really scored upon um, in in this competition, but just as a as a total X factor in your specific style of ride. What what was the one that um, you you would most like to to get on in in real life at full scale? I would love to ride the cows. OSU's cows just hit differently. Um, there's something about that movement pattern that seems very chaotic, but still enjoyable. And the fact that it's themed to flying cows is just even more amazing. I think any team that proposed uh, 2G down, negative 2G, I think that'd be pretty exciting. Uh, so we'll see if that happens one day. They have to update the standards for that. They're pretty cool. I personally really like the uh, UC ride, the, the accelerator, just because I think it was probably the one ride concept I've seen that to me was a, was a new concept, not something that we had ever seen anything like before. I mean, we have rides that swing, but with the, the seat motion, I would have loved to see that one in action. I would go with the uh... Virginia Techs because I've written Falcon's Fury and it is insane and I, I know how insane it is so um, yeah I, I think I'd, I'd want to get on that one again. It's a tricky one. I, I'm generally not super big on spinny rides or droppy rides <laughs> just because the, the motion usually gets my head a little funny. Um, but I'd say the, the cow ride definitely was very unique. <laughs> that looked like it would be really interesting. I'm not sure I could do it for more than a cycle or two, but <laughs> definitely looked like something I'd like to give a try. All right. For our last question, who wants it? Got a bunch of our IT people here. We've got some more OSU people. We've got UB here. Um, I guess I have like kind of a a question. Oh, so, sorry. Do I have to? Oh, okay, oh, go for it. You go. Okay. Yep. Um. So after like um doing all like these sort of like um, hands-on like projects and stuff. Um, like, I mean, there's a lot of things to like gain from here. Um, what would you, like out, out of everything that we gained here, what would you say is like, I guess the number one like uh, beneficial thing that we gained? Like, is it either like better teamwork, uh, just more knowledge of the field in general? Like, what, like out of everything you've seen, which, which aspect of this do you think like will most help us uh, get into the theme, theme park uh, the theme park uh, industry, or will help us also like adjust to it as well. I mean, really all of it. I know that's a, it sounds like a cop out answer, but every aspect of what you guys did is an aspect of uh, something that happens in the, the industry as a whole. So whatever you learned the most is the most beneficial and you can gear your search in the industry towards the thing that you did the best at, the thing that you learned the most or the thing that you liked the most and maybe figuring out what aspect of the project you liked the best might help you figure out which path you might want to take through the industry and maybe that's what's beneficial. Yeah, I'd say the a lot of the parts that you've learned here, especially the documentation side, is something that I think is very useful. You've also gotten to meet and see a lot of different people that I remember hearing five years ago from another group presentation that I was at. Look around you. You're going to see these same people around you. If you join this industry, 
you'll see us, but you'll also see some of the other students here. So making those connections at events like this is also very useful. Oh, yeah. I remember at one point, um, Mike, Dave, Harrison, and I were all just sitting in an ASTM room looking for jobs at the same time, and here we are. I would say um, definitely failing. As negative as that is, it's something that school doesn't let you do and still move forward. That's not going to happen in real life. If you fail, then there's going to be a reason and hopefully you will be well supported. So you'll be able to understand what you did before it gets to anything tragic. And you'll take away something from it. Yeah, I guess uh, as uh, some people have been saying, it's really whatever you took away the most from. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys feel that whether it's in the reviews or in the presentations or working on the models and you know, having trouble, uh, hopefully something clicked there and said, I'll do it differently next time. It's kind of funny. Oh, uh, first off, thank you for like your responses, but um, it's kind of funny that you kind of mentioned that um, because we actually have a professor here at UB and uh, one of his sayings goes that like you put as much into a project as you get out of it. Like you get as much out of a project as you put into it. So even if like, you know, let's say that we do the worst out of like, you know, everything here. If we put a lot of effort into this, we can still use this as even like as far as like an industry standpoint, like even getting an internship, we can still use this as a way to say like, hey, we did this. This is what we did, dot, dot, dot. I mean, and like, even though everyone else like, you know, we came in last, everyone else was just like, also great and like we just did a, a lot of stuff so i just find it funny that like you kind of mentioned that because that's kind of like a saying that like uh one of the professors here um said, uh, talks a lot about mike did you have something to add to uh i, I was just gonna to, to echo two points one in your original question mentioned teamwork i think it's it's something that's gonna go with you no matter what industry you're in. Uh, it's not exclusive by any means to the, the themed entertainment industry. Um, but you know, you really end up working in so many groups, whether it's in, within your own companies or honestly, if you're a vendor, you're, you're, you have a client that you need to, you need to please and, and work with. Um, and so I think that's hugely important. And then really just to, to echo what Amato said, like, yes, you're all here competing um, you know, I, there were, you know, I, years ago I was competing against Harrison at a, at a Ryerson competition. And now here we are, you know, we both have our own industry jobs and both love what we do, but all these people are have met six years ago at, uh, petitions when and their people love to, to connect with and interact with as, as often as I can, even in the hectic world we're in. Um, so, you know. I hope you guys were able to take some advantage of the student lounge even and just being able to interact with each other uh, as much as possible. Unfortunately, with COVID, it had to be a Zoom lounge and you weren't all hanging out together. Uh, but, you know, soon enough, that, that won't be the case anymore. I'm still upset that Mike's team won that year, but still buds. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, that was that was a wonderful experience, I think, all around for us. And, and I appreciate all the people I got to meet through that first conference. Well, first one for us. Yeah, it's definitely great. So competitions like this, definitely a lot of fun. All right. Thank you to all of our panelists, Mike, Matt, Amato, Gabe, and Harrison. Um, thank you all for joining us. We're going to um, cut for about 15 minutes here as we prepare for the award ceremony and we will be announcing the winners of this year's ride engineering competition so join us in about 15 minutes thanks everybody thank, thank you. you thank you thank you